All right. Um, we will today begin our, uh, let's see, fifth right, special topic. Um, we started with rigid biodynamics, proceeded with linear elasticity, mechanics of salt materials, atomic to continuum scale transition, and this one is going to be about fluid dynamics. And specifically, I would like to talk a little bit about Navier-Stokes equations. Um, now, in this part of the course, what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, um, slightly make a change to the notation that we preferred so far. And in our preferred notation, when I express divergence or gradient, or for that matter, if we needed a curl, I would specifically write it with a capital or a lowercase letter. Uh, because it matters which configuration we're evaluating these derivatives with respect to. Um, now, there is an exception in some sense, and that is linear elasticity. In that case, all of those derivatives are with respect to a coordinate choice that you make, typically the reference one, but really doesn't matter. Divergence with respect to reference or updated spatial ones are uh, roughly the same because their formations are small. But even then, I prefer the old notation. So um, here, uh, sticking to uh, the accepted notation of fluid dynamics, I'd like to actually use, instead of divergence, for instance, I like to um, use this notation, which I had, of course, summarized way at the beginning as an alternative choice. And instead of gradient, I will simply write that. And instead of curl, I will simply write this. Well, the reason is, well, you might say, well, we're not indicating the, uh, the coordinate with respect to which we are evaluating these derivatives when I write this. But really, in fluid dynamics, there is only one coordinate or configuration, uh, coordinate system or configuration. And that has to do with the spatial one. Okay. Um, and in fact, uh, what we could argue from a material modeling, or in this case, a fluid modeling perspective, is that any configuration would qualify as a reference configuration uh, for a fluid. You don't have some preferred state with respect to which you express uh, material behavior for a fluid. Uh, you do, however, for a solid. We talk about an undeformed configuration. We know that that configuration is where the, fluid, the, the solid is on stress. But if I take a piece of a, a bowl of fluid, and that would be, let's say, our reference configuration, or simultaneously as it to evolves with time, suppose I'm stirring it, uh, it's the evolving spatial configuration, I could stir it and let it rest. And once it's rest, it's again, nothing is happening. It just looks like the beginning. But for sure, it's not like the beginning because I've stirred it rigorously. But it's just as good as a unperturbed state as it was at the beginning of the experiment. So the fact that I do this thing or mix it up for a fluid, it's not really influencing its, uh, its, its, its let me say, uh, behavior in subsequent time. Uh, whereas if I take a, f a solid and if I deform it significantly, and in that deformed state, if I perturb its, uh, let me say, deformation and try to see how it be behaves about a perturbed, uh, about a deformed state, that perturbation is going to give rise to different stresses than perturbation about a completely undeformed state. So, so, so the, 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 um, the, the behavior of two types of uh, materials are quite different. And we could sort of analyze these things from a mathematical perspective for sure in more detail and argue, well, we could say any configuration is a reference configuration for a fluid, et cetera. We're not doing all of that, right? Um, but, um, because of these small technicalities and because theoretically and numerically you stick to the spatial configuration, there is really one coordinate. And I'm not going to distinguish it with letters. I'm just going to write, prefer, uh, prefer the symbolic notation, let me say. Um, now, having said that, now, of course, we're talking about fluids. And the, even based on the examples that I've just given, the uh, kinem kinem 
the, the kinematics of a fluid is also actually different. And to gain insight into the kinematics of a fluid, we would have to, let's say, discuss a certain number of concepts, right? So uh, we would talk about the path line, we would talk about the streamline, streak line, maybe even vortex line, things like this that would uh, sort of clarify the complex dynamics of a fluid. And the dynamics of a fluid is quite complex, I would say, compared to solids because of the immense amount of mixing that could occur, the independent motions of the individual particles, uh, et cetera. It's, it's, I would say, um, um, more complex with respect to a solid. So um, the starting point would, of course, be the kinematics of fluid motion. But that would be the topic of a fluid dynamics course, okay? And this is not a fluid dynamics course. This is a solid mechanics oriented continuum mechanics course. And we're just throwing in some, uh, a topic on fluid dynamics, right? As we've done before on dynamics, solid mechanics, a little bit of material science and now fluid mechanics. So to see how continuum mechanics fits into these um, general, uh, let me say, or how it plays a role in these general uh, fields, right? Uh, but I do want to talk about, nevertheless, about the kinematics of fluid motion with respect to one particular um, object, and that is called the vorticity. And my purpose in talking about vorticity is a, a little bit, and this now will fit very nicely to what we've done so far because I'm going to now use a little bit about um, rigid body dynamics to explain what vorticity is, and eventually, to understand the role of uh, velocity gradients in material modeling with respect to fluids, I'm going to make use a little bit of um, linear elasticity, right? So eventually, uh, what I'm going to talk about will help us make a link to what we've seen before and will help us, let me say, understand the um, modeling aspects with respect to a fluid. So vorticity in that sense will play a role. So let me first begin by recalling rigid body dynamics. And you can, at this point, or after this lecture, go back to your notes and remember the details if you need to do so, but I'll remind you as much as you need to know. Um, so in rigid body dynamics, right, we have the current um, position vector specified in terms of the reference one through a proper orthogonal rotation tensor and a translation. So for the, such a motion, the deformation gradient is obviously a simple rotation. So F would be a proper orthogonal uh, tensor times, for instance, in the right polar decomposition, a stretch tensor. But that tensor is identity because we're talking about a rigid body. It doesn't stretch. Um, so what you could also do is you could calculate the velocity gradient. And the velocity gradient is... Actually, we have calculated it, but we didn't call it directly f. L is f dot f transpose. It's an expression we've derived before, but f is nothing but q. So f dot becomes q dot, and here we have q transpose. Okay? And this is a tensor that we had seen in rigid body dynamics, and we had called it omega, and that is a skew tensor. And just like any skew symmetric tensor, it has an axial vector, and we called it a vector omega, which was the <laughs> angular velocity vector, okay? So now, having reminded you that much, let me proceed with also reminding what the velocity is. The velocity of any point could be written as the velocity of the center of mass, which we call V bar, plus the rate of change of relative position with respect to center of mass. R bar is relative position, dot would be its rate of change. And so R bar is equal to x minus x bar. And what we had found out that was that R bar dot is equal to that tensor omega R bar, and since small omega, the vector, is its axial vector, we could alternatively express it as such. So, so far, really, there is nothing new. I'm just reviewing. 
Now I'm going to throw in one additional particular expression. And this you can verify on your own. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate one half the curl of the velocity field. This is the velocity field, right? Now, when I take its curl, right, I'm going to take derivatives implicitly. When I take derivatives of v, first of all, v bar does not depend on space, spatial position. It belongs to the center of mass, so it's a constant for that purpose, so it drops out. Then I would have to take the derivative of that. In other words, I would have to take the derivative of this. This belongs to the body. It's a constant for derivation purposes. And then when I take the derivative of r bar, it entails x and x bar. x bar is also a constant for derivative purposes. It belongs to the center of mass. So the only derivative, derivative I'm taking uh, with respect to is with respect to x, and it's in here. Everything else is a constant. So if you evaluate this, what you will find out is that, and go ahead and show this, okay? The outcome is omega, the axial vector. All right, so interesting that, that we had not seen before, but one half curl of the velocity field happens to be the angular velocity vector uh, associated with the rigid body motion. And in terms of components, what you will recognize or remember from one of the early homeworks is that we can express it in terms of, therefore, the components of the tensor with respect to this vector belongs as such, okay? All right, so given the tensor, I can construct that vector, and the curl of v, one half the curl of v, is equal to that vector. All right, so that's some additional piece of information. Okay, so now um, there was a tensor that we introduced a long time ago, but really we didn't make much use of it. Um, and that was the velocity gradient tensor and its decomposition into its symmetric and skew symmetric parts. So the symmetric part was called D, the skew symmetric part was called W. And D was called the, um, one of the names is the stretching tensor, and the other one was the vorticity tensor. And now we wonder why they are called like that, right? So um, first of all, if I have a rigid body, right? If I have a rigid body, nothing stretches. So D is supposed to be equal to zero. And indeed, it would be equal to zero because for a rigid body, L is equal to tensor omega, okay? Which is automatically skew symmetric. And therefore, when you calculate the symmetric part of that, well, there is none, it's skew symmetric, so it's automatically equal to zero, right? Um, okay, so in that case, D is equal to omega, the symmetric part, which is equal to zero, and W is equal to omega for, a, uh, for the case of a rigid body. Okay. Um, now, let's calculate the axial vector of W because it is a skew symmetric tensor. It should have an axial vector. And let me call it not a vector omega, but a vector W. And that is supposed to be minus 1 half um, E i j k. I'm following the same expression for the axial vector components. Okay, That is the general expression, right? 
Uh, but now in this case, I know precisely what WJK is. It is the skew symmetric part of the velocity gradient tensor. So it's one half VJ comma K minus VK comma J. And now what you can do is you can uh, work on that expression a little bit. And here I will say again, show that if you plug in this partic explicit expression for the tensor W, the vortex to tensor in there, and evaluate this term out, okay, simplify it a little bit, you can show that W is exactly equal to the one half of curl of V, okay? Why is that possible? Because we see the components of V, we see, der we see derivatives with respect to V, and it turns out that those derivatives combine into curl of V, and there's a factor one half, okay? Again, this is something you can show. So it turns out that the axial vector of the vortice to tensor for rigid body motion, okay, first of all, is, or, or let me take a step back. The axial vector of the vortice to tensor is in every case, whether I have a solid or a fluid, whatever, a general velocity field is expressed as one half curl of V. And one half, one half curl of V is precisely equal to the angular velocity vector if I have rigid body motion, okay? So one half curl of V is something that has to do with the rate of what rotation. What is the unit of W and what is the unit of the vector omega? It is one over seconds, okay? That is precisely the unit of angular velocity, right? So this is something that we can now, based on our knowledge of rigid body dynamics, something we can interpret as something that has to do with rigid body motion. And now we see that therefore, in general, perhaps W is something that has to do with rigid body motion, okay? And that interpretation is 100% clear if I have a rigid body, all right? But I don't have a rigid body. Okay, so now what would I do then? Or can I still uh, maintain that interpretation? So a, clearly a fluid um, is not a rigid body. So in that case, you don't have d equals zero. d is not equal to zero for a fluid, and indeed it will play an important role in generating stress. Um, and w in general is not equal to zero. But even then, and at this point, you can consult some of the um, classical references in fluid dynamics based on the interpretation that rigorously holds in the case of rigid body dynamics, you can make small constructs, some, let me say, uh, small um, diagrams that interpret W as something that governs rotation of tiny volumes of fluid about the point of interest at which you're calculating W. Okay, so you can look at a certain point, and at that point, let's say we look at the current configuration of a fluid, okay, and I'm looking at a point, and at that point, so I have a velocity distribution here, velocity field, I can calculate L and hence construct W, and let us imagine that momentarily I put, I can inject there a perfectly controlled uh, a, a spherical die, a perfectly controlled uh, geometrical shape. And I can control how, what happens to it, okay? So one can then argue as that, that W is what makes the spherical die rotate, okay? 
Okay? And the angular velocity of rotation would have to do with one half curl of the velocity field, or it would be precisely the axial vector of this tensor, W. Okay? So W is what governs the rotation of a tiny volume of fluid at the point of interest. So that would be the rate of rotation. That's what W governs okay? about the point of interest. Now, on the other hand, D is not equal to zero, and D is called the stretching tensor. And indeed, what that will do is it will deform this spherical volume of fluid into an ellipsoidal shape. Now, D is a symmetric tensor. It is guaranteed to have three mutually orthogonal um, eigenvectors. And so let us call those some principal directions. So about these principal directions, it will have eigenvalues that govern the rate of deformation along those principal directions, which will deform the sphere into, let's say it stretches along that axis, compresses along the other axis, it will deform it into some sort of ellipsoid. So if you put indeed a spherical die at that point, what will happen to it is it will deform, start to or attempt to deform into an ellipsoid, which is governed by the tensor D, and simultaneously it will try to spin, which is governed by the tensor W. Okay? So that is the general motion that that spherical die, got, a die would go through, and that's what you would then, if you had a fast camera, what you would observe happening to that spherical die. It would eventually deform into And ellipsoid. Okay. All right. Now there is, of course, also a certain amount of so the shape changes. The shape, updated shape, is rotating as well. Uh, now, how about the total volume of the shape? Well, that depends on whether or not the fluid is incompressible. So if it's incompressible and if we omit the diffusion of the dye into the surrounding fluid, then the volume needs to be preserved if it is incompressible, for instance, right? Okay, so um, now we've made a very quickly, of course, this, just like in every other topic, these, to these concepts that we're mentioning certainly deserve more discussion than we, can, we have time for here, but at least now we have an idea about the role that these two tensors play. And those tensors are very important in the context of fluid dynamics. Okay, so D, it has to do with the rate at which stretching occurs along the principal directions. And W has to do with the rate at which rotation occurs about the point of interest. Good. OK. Uh, so now we've seen this vector appearing, 1 half curl of V. We're going to drop the 1 half because it's just a factor. And we're just going to look at the curl of V, and it turns out that this vector has a name. It's called the vorticity vector. Okay? Uh, I'm not going to give it a separate symbol in this case um, because uh, we're not really going to make use of it a lot. Right? Um, but um, let's mention a concept that has to do with the kinematics of fluid motion. If curl of the velocity vector is equal to zero, such a fluid flow is called irrotational. Okay? And now we understand the, let me say, the geometri geometrical interpretation behind that expression irrotational because curl of V is what has, has to do with instantaneous rotation about a point of interest, right? Um, okay, um, so by the way, um, irrotational or curl-free is 
a particular concept that appears sometimes. Another concept that you will see is a vector field that is solenoidal. It simply means that divergence of v is equal to 0. Okay, so I'm just mentioning that on the fly because sometimes when you open a fluid dynamics book, you see, you see that a vector field which is simultaneously solenoidal and irrotational. In that case, there are certain mathematical techniques that you can apply to analyze such a flow. Um, and so I just mentioned that uh, in passing. Okay? And you notice this constraint to be what we call incompressibility. And we're going to recall that together in just a few minutes. Um, all right. So the vorticity is something that has to do with the rate of rotation, something that's very close to the angular velocity vector, um, or it is the angular velocity vector times 2 for a rigid body, but in general still it's interpreted as something that has to do with rotation. And indeed, this vector, um, it, it governs the uh, formation or let me say the structure of rotational, let me say, um, 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 flows in um, fluid dynamics, all right? And so that's something you encounter a lot. And we're going to um, encounter this concept just once again when I briefly talk about turbulence. Um, okay, so now um, let's just, before moving to the kinetics of fluid motion, let us just look at that expression once again and ask ourselves the following question. Now, first, I notice that if V happens to, okay, at this point, I don't know what phi is, but if V happens to be the gradient of some potential, then such a velocity vector is immediately irrotational because the curl of the gradient of a scalar is equal to zero, as you will remember from one of the homework problems. Okay, so then, curl of V is equal to zero. So, therefore one can say that a sufficient condition for, the, for a vector field to be irrotational is that it is expressible in that form. But it's a sufficient condition. In other words, we do not know if, we do not know whether every velocity vector that is irrotational has to be of that form or not, okay? So we don't know if it's a necessary condition, but it turns out that under relatively mild conditions, that is precisely the case. In other words, it is also a necessary condition. So it turns out for irrotational flow, V must come from the gradient of a potential. So it is a requirement. In other words, it's a necessary condition as well. Okay. In order to ensure that curl of V is equal to zero. So if V is of that form, this is guaranteed. And if V is irrotational, then this is also guaranteed. So they imply each other, again, under mild conditions. Okay. Um, so here phi is some Eulerian field that could depend on position and time. Uh, and that would be our velocity potential. And I'm mentioning this because we're going to briefly recall it um, soon. All right. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, so now that's so much about the kinematics of fluid motion. Now let's move on to kinetics. 
Um, well, the starting point, of course, is, again, the mass balance. And we recall that to be rho dot rho, now expressed in, our, expressed in the preferred notation, rho, plus, rho dot plus rho divergence v. That has to be equal to um, 0. And now we are going to invoke the incompressible the assumption, not because that is necessarily always the case, but because either the fluid is incompressible, like water, or because you're dealing with some generally incompressible fluid like air, but at reasonably low velocities where you can still invoke the incompressible assumption to a very good approximation. So this is one particular case that we are going to analyze. Okay? So we're going to look at incompressible flows. And so rho dot has to be equal to 0. And then we remember that the requirement, the corresponding requirement, or the constraint on the velocity field is that divergence of v has to be equal to 0. Okay. So this is our mass balance now. Okay. And it's, since we don't really have to worry about the density because it's a constant, it appears to be now uh, a constraint on the flow field v. And um, as we had shown before, this is equal to the trace of the velocity gradient tensor. The velocity gradient tensor is the gradient of v. And therefore, in terms of components, this here is v i comma i. And that's simultaneously equal to trace of the stretching tensor d because trace of w is equal to 0. And what we also remember is that the deviatoric part of d is its trace this part, right? The deviatoric part of a tensor is the tensor itself minus the part that governs the trace. But the trace is equal to 0, and therefore, the tensor is equal to its deviatoric part. Okay? Let's just keep that in mind. Okay. All right. Uh, now we move on to linear momentum balance. And linear momentum balance is divergence of the Cauchy stress tensor. Rho B is equal to rho V dot. And here we again face the issue of modeling t because I have more unknowns here than I have equations. Um, and therefore, I need to somehow relate t to, or I need to relate kinematics to kinetics. Right? And in order to do that, let's take a step back and recall what we had done in the case of um, linear elasticity because it turns out that the um, modeling of a fluid, the one that at least we are particularly interested in, namely a Newtonian viscous fluid, the modeling of such a fluid is very similar to modeling of the stress in linear elasticity. And based on now our understanding of the roles of D and W, the stretching and the vorticity tensors, we can um, carry out that modeling. Okay, so let's first recall um, isotropic linear elasticity. So I'll just write down the expression that's going to be useful for us. In that case, we had written stress is the bulk modulus trace epsilon identity plus 2 mu, the shear modulus, the deviatoric part of the infinitesimal um, strain tensor. And here, epsilon is. the symmetric part of the 
displacement gradient tensor. Okay. And let me write it like that in the notation of this section. OK. Um, now, why don't you not write for a few minutes and have a look here, and let's discuss that particular equation in a, in a, in a specific case where the bulk modulus becomes much, much larger, larger than the shear modulus. Okay? So um, in such a case, so this is just a relative order of magnitude. So if you like, what I can also say is that kappa goes to infinity. And we understand what that means physically. It makes the solid object incompressible. Okay? Why? Because this is a certain amount of pressure. Minus p is kappa trace epsilon. Okay? And the volume change is governed by the determinant of the deformation gradient tensor, but that's equal to 1 plus trace epsilon when deformation is small. And so now, when I look at this expression, this is a pressure, and pressure is something that is physical. It has a finite magnitude, okay? Um, Whereas this is so large that for this to remain finite, trace of epsilon has to be tiny. So in other words, if I let kappa go to infinity, then the only way this can remain finite is if trace of epsilon goes to zero. Okay? So trace of epsilon is approximately equal to zero is what I get out of this argument. And trace of epsilon equals zero means that the volume is not changing because J is equal to 1 in that scenario, no volume change. All right. Um, so bulk modulus going to infinity means that the material cannot change its volume, or as long as you, or, or the amount of pressure that you have to exert in order to induce a reasonable amount of volume change is unrealizably large, all right? So you cannot essentially, even if this is not theoretically infinite, and it may not be, it's so large that if you want to induce any meaningful volume change, P has to be unrealistically large, okay? which is, let's say, physically not possible, okay? So we approximate as, uh, in this case, as having absolutely no volume change. All right, so if there is no volume change, trace of epsilon is equal to zero, and hence, when I look at the deviatoric part of epsilon, which is by the same argument as I've mentioned before, it's defined as such, and this is equal to zero, and therefore it's equal to itself, right? The deviatoric part of epsilon is equal to epsilon. Hence, when I go back and write sigma, I can simply write it as kappa trace epsilon, but now I want to be careful because trace of epsilon is almost zero and kappa is extremely large, I don't want to play with the multiplication of two numbers, one of which is super large, one of which is super small. Numerically, if I want to Im eventually implement such a, uh, such a formulation, it would cause trouble. Okay? So instead of having two things that are ill-defined, let me say, I'm going to work with what is well-defined and a finite number, which is the pressure. Okay? So I, directly, I'm going to here write minus p. Okay, minus pi plus 2 mu epsilon deviatoric, which now is equal to itself. Okay. Good. Okay. So if you indeed carry out the numerical implementation or make a, let me say, a theoretical analysis of this, in that case, well, you might ask yourself, well, what is p? How do I find out what it is? Well, what it is is, is technically, it's a Lagrange multiplier which in a, if you formulate your problem well, then you can actually find out what the Lagrange multiplier is. So it's a Lagrange multiplier that enforces a constraint. And what's the constraint? Trace of epsilon should be equal to zero. So technically, when you carry out the implementation, then that's how you would interpret uh, the role that P plays. Okay, so it's something that you can actually 
calculate, right? So if you think about it, you still have the same number of unknowns before conceptually you had the trace of epsilon and the deviatoric part which together amounts to a, uh, let me say, a, a certain number of unknowns. And now you're replacing trace of epsilon with a pressure. You're replacing one thing with something else. Still, you have the same number of unknowns in a sense. Okay. So this is the case of isotropic linear elasticity in the case when we have additionally incompressibility. Okay. So why don't you write that much? All right, so now, having now some understanding of the implications of the incompressible behavior in the case of something that we're familiar with, namely isotropic linear elasticity, now we can move on to the case of fluids. And what I would like to specifically talk about is the case of a Newtonian viscous flow in the case when we have incompressibility. And what we would like to do is we would like to similarly model now the Cauchy stress. Okay. And now the interpretation is going to go as follows. Now, um, I have an incompressible material. Okay. And as a consequence, the volume is not going to change. In the case of linear elasticity, epsilon has to do with the symmetric part of the displacement gradient tensor. And that is what governs the stress. The deviatoric part is equal to itself because its trace is equal to zero. Okay? Uh, well, at this point, you might also ask, why am I looking only at the symmetric part? What happened to the skew symmetric part? Well, the skew symmetric part, remember, and that was a comment I made in passing, is what governs infinitesimal rotations. And rotations should not influence the stress, right? Rotation, pure rotation, should not cause a stress. And therefore, we had omitted that. OK, so now presently, I have a very similar scenario. And this is the simplest I could do by analogy. Well, I have an incompressible material. And it's a fluid. It's a viscous fluid. It's going to have, based on my experimental knowledge, some viscosity. Let us call that viscosity again mu. And I'm not going to multiply it with the symmetric part of a displacement gradient, but with the symmetric part of the velocity gradient tensor. Okay. And the symmetric part of the velocity gradient tensor is equal to d. Well, what about writing the deviatoric part of d? Well, the deviatoric part of d is equal to exactly d because the fluid is incompressible. So there is no need to write deviatoric here as I had done over here, right? So well, the trace of D is zero because the fluid is incompressible. And this thing is deviatoric. What happens to what remains here? Well, what remains is here is essentially there should be some pressure that essentially acts as a Lagrange multiplier, which enforces the trace of d or the divergence of the velocity field to vanish. Okay? That would act as a Lagrange multiplier that enforces the incompressibility constraint. Okay? So then, finally, you might ask yourself, well, why do I only have d? How about rotations? Well, rotations should not influence right, the stresses by the same argument. So the rotation should not play a role. And in other words, the skew symmetric part of the velocity gradient tensor, which is precisely equal to the vorticity tensor, 
should not play a role. And now I understand that because I have already linked W to rotation. Okay, so it should not appear in the stress tensor. Okay. And that is how one can, by analogy, argue a form of the Cauchy stress tensor for a incompressible fluid. So here, let me just also comment that d deviatoric is equal to d as well in this setting. Um, and we're talking about Newtonian fluids, in which case the viscosity is a constant. It does not depend on, let's say, the magnitude of the velocity in any way. Now, the analogy I've made is meaningful from theoretical and numerical perspectives. And the extension of the analogy is also meaningful to a certain um, in a certain sense, namely, well, uh, now that you know about the mechanics of salt materials as well, you might ask yourself, well, the relation between stress and displacement or the gradients of the displacement is linear in this setting. Well, it is so because I'm talking about linear elasticity, but now you also know about hyperelasticity, in which case the relation is not linear. So then you might ask yourself here, well, the relation between the Cauchy stress and the velocity field or its gradient is linear in this case. Is it possible that it's not linear? And the answer is yes. Okay, in general, t is a function of position and time, etc. But eventually, some function, let's say, hat of the velocity gradient tensor. Uh, but when you say that your fluid is Newtonian, then that relation is linear. If you want to talk about some other exotic fluid that is not Newtonian, then the relationship is not necessarily linear. There could be terms here which are nonlinear in D. All right? And again, that's just a remark in passing. We're not going to dig it any further. All right? So this is the expression that we are going to use. The material model for a Newtonian viscous fluid and we're now going to take it and plug it into the linear momentum balance and see what we get out of it. Okay. So, um, back to linear momentum balance. And I'm going to go ahead and calculate the divergence of the Cauchy stress tensor, which I now know is of the form minus pi plus 2 mu, the velocity, symmetric part of the velocity gradient tensor, plus rho b is equal to rho v dot. Um, so let's expand um, these terms a little bit. So here I have a tensor components i and j. Uh, so let me first write that. So minus p delta ij plus 2 mu the velocity gradient tensor. So it's going to be 1 half. And 1 half is going to cancel that to vi comma j plus vj comma i. And the whole thing has a derivative with respect to j because I'm taking the divergence. And of course, there is a basis vector ei here. Okay. 
Uh, so that's the same thing in component notation. And now I'm going to look at that expression. So it's minus p comma j, right? And then there is delta ij. I can invoke the Kronecker, the substitution property. So it's that. So that is p comma i plus mu vi comma jj plus vj comma ji. All right, so now let's further have a look at that term. That's vj comma ij, but the order of the derivative really doesn't make any difference. So I can also write it as vj comma j, okay, and then comma i. And vj comma j is divergence of v, which by the incompressibility constraint is equal to zero, so this term dies away, and this is what I have to look at. And here what I see is the, grade, the divergence of the gradient of the velocity vector. So this is divergence of gradient v, or it's associated with it apart from the basis vector. Okay, um, and when you see the divergence of the gradient of a field, there is a typical notation that one invokes. It's the Laplacian of the quantity that you're operating on. Right? So that's just a shorthand notation for divergence gradient. Okay? Sometimes one uses a delta sign. This is the notation that I will prefer. Okay? So that is our Laplacian. Okay, so this is equal to trace of L is equal to zero. And therefore, after this simplification, what we end up with is minus P comma I E I is nothing but the gradient of P plus mu Laplacian V plus rho B is equal to rho v dot. And here I'm going to expand v explicitly to make a point. I'm going to write it as del v over del t plus, right, the convective term, if you like, gradient of v operating on v. Now, this should not confuse you, right? Perhaps I should put a parenthesis around gradient of v to highlight that that's a tensor. You obtain that first, and then you operate on the velocity. Uh, but I'm not going to write those parentheses. I think that context, when it appears, will make everything clear. Okay? So that's the equation that we, that we um, end up with. And this is what one calls the Navier-Stokes equations. And of course, we have the accompanying constraint that the divergence of the velocity field has to be equal to zero. In fact, I've already made use of it when I was uh, deriving it. The fact that I've invoked it is not necessary to ensure it. I've invoked it because I know that, that it has to be so, but it's something that I additionally have to make sure uh, to satisfy. Okay, so that's still an additional constraint. And when I look now, I have four unknowns and four equations. The equations, three equations, that's a vectorial equation coming from there, an additional one there. So four equations and four unknowns. The equations are mass balance and linear momentum balance. 
and the four unknowns are the pressure and the velocity field. Okay. Let's write this in blue. Question about the derivation. Now, as neat as this formulation may look, it is a difficult problem. And the difficulty has to do with two aspects, one of which is, let me say, easier, certainly, than the other one. One is a numerical issue, and the numerical issue is satisfying this constraint. And these days, there are well-accepted methods for uh, dealing with the constraint the in, of, of enforcing that the divergence is equal to zero. It is not trivial, but okay, there are ways of doing it. Um, and that is, if you like, some numerical challenge, let me say. But there is also another challenge that is more physical, and that appears in the right-hand side of the equation. So when you look at the left-hand side of the equation, the left-hand side is beautiful. And it's beautiful because it is linear in the velocity. So it looks as though everything is linear in V. In fact, if you look at this form, so in other words, if instead of V dot, I had not written this, and if you see V dot, you might even be tempted to think that everything is linear in V, but it is not so. Because if I uncover that term, the second term here is nonlinear in V. And in fact, in many cases, in particular when you have um, um, inertial forces dominating a flow, and that's that term. It has to do with inertia. This nonlinearity is what causes the richness in the physics, and that is the difficulty in the solution. So it's not a linear problem. Linear problem, nonlinear problem means that it is, in, in a sense, harder to solve. Nonlinear problems are always harder to solve. So you need, uh, let me say, uh, well. Um, constructed numerical methods for dealing with such nonlinearities. Okay? Um, now, that we will keep in mind, but eventually, uh, when I proceed at some point, uh, I will replace this with v dot. Uh, but again, when necessary, I will expand it into this form back again, and we will see how this nonlinearity causes trouble at some uh, point, specifically in the context of. Um, turbulence. All right. Um, all right. So we now have. Where are we now? We talked a little bit about the kinematics of fluid flow for the purpose of understand the role that these tensors D and W play, uh, and eventually, based on that understanding, we carried out the modeling of the stress because that's necessary for closure. We had at the in the previous board more unknowns than equations, but now that I have a material model, I have also made use of it, and now I end up with four equations and four unknowns. That's a well-defined problem, and I could go ahead and, in principle, solve that for a case of interest. Now, however, because fluid problems can be notoriously hard, um, it is necessary and beneficial to make simplifications when possible. All right? And let's, therefore, talk about some special flow uh, situations, and also on the reformulation of the Navier-Stokes equation uh, in a special form that will help us um, understand the role of the Reynolds number eventually, okay? which you'll re you will again remember from undergraduate mechanics. Um, so some special and alternative forms is what follows next. Okay, so let me begin with one alternative form that will help me get rid of the body force. Um, and we begin constructing that form by recalling that rho is a constant, okay? And um, because the fluid is incompressible. And 
we are going to take the body force to be gravity because it plays an important role in, uh, let me say, in many fluid flows. And that would be our gravitational constant. And now what I like to do is I like to reformulate rho times b or the body force vector as the gradient of the vector itself dotted with x, okay? So this, if you calculate, b is equal to minus g e3, so this is nothing but minus g x3, okay? And if you take the gradient of minus rho g x3, you will end up with precisely that expression because the gradient operates only on one coordinate. It will have only one non-zero component, and that non-zero component is along the third direction. Okay? So why did I do that trick? Because then what you can do is you can embed the body force. Now that it's the gradient of something, and because the pressure also appears in the gradient, you can lump those two terms into one term. Namely, you can write minus gradient of p plus rho g x3, okay? Plus now mu Laplacian of the velocity field is equal to, I'm just writing rho times acceleration without a particular expansion. And this term here is what I will call simply p tilde. It is sometimes referred to as the head. So it's the actual pressure plus a contribution from uh, the gravity, right? Uh, so in other words, there is a simple way with which you could get rid of this body force, and if you eventually, after solving your problem, you are interested in the real pressure, you just have to subtract something from that, from the head, you have to subtract one part to calculate, to find out the actual pressure in the fluid, right? So the problem is a tiny bit more simplified. So from now on, when I write the equations of uh, Navier-Stokes equations, I'm just going to write minus gradient p tilde plus Laplace in v is equal to acceleration, right? Uh, and in fact, I'm even going to drop the tilde, okay? So when I write p from now on, if you like, understand that I'm actually dealing with the head, I don't want to carry the uh, notational um, burden, okay? So I have now minus gradient p tilde plus mu Laplacian v is equal to rho v dot. And I'm also going to drop the tilde. OK, so now that we have a slightly more uh, simplified set of Navier-Stokes equations, what we're going to do is we're going to simplify or adopt those equations to a series of, let me say, a cascade of uh, simpler problems in particular cases of physical interest. And that's what we're going to start with uh, next time. All right? So until then. <laughs>